And let's pray. O oh, gracious God, as we prepare to hear your word read and as we reflect on it, we pray that your Holy Spirit will move within us, will still our hearts and minds and so that we can learn and see you more clearly. In Christ we pray, amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, and this is actually one of the passages that inspired our first hymn this morning, the, the image of God as the vineyard um, caretaker and us as wild grapes who need to be pruned, and, and uh, so there's judgment, but there is also grace. So uh, I hope you hear some of that in this passage. Isaiah chapter five, one through seven. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed it out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Our epistle lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 through 12, 2. This is actually a bit of a continuation of the passage from Hebrews we heard last week as the writer is kind of walking through this list of faithful people whose faith brought them along, and we kind of continue that today. So I invite you to hear this from the epistle of Hebrews. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. What more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and of David and Samuel and the prophets, those who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, but for, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection, Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went out in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not without us be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, 
the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Recently, I have been rereading a book I read only a year ago. It's called Call It Grace, Finding Meaning in a Fractured World by doc, the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, who is president of Union Seminary in New York. In her book, Dr. Jones reflects on the family stories and events that have helped shape her, influenced her faith and her theology, and made her who and what she is today. She sees where and how those experiences, some of them known through the family, passing them down through generations, um, have impacted her. And she shares her family stories that help to shape her not only as an individual, but as in a way that only families do the influence they have had in shaping generation after generation, the influence, the story of her life and those who have come before us have had. As she was writing this book, call it Grace, she said people would ask her what the book was about. So she started by telling people Well, it's about the four things that provide the foundation of my theology. The the necessity of our interconnecting breath, the importance of struggling for justice, the beauty of mercy, and the ultimate power of love. She said when she did that, people would just kind of, okay, and change the subject. But then she said when she started telling people about the stories that were in her book, she said people became more interested. If I told them that this book was about the horrific lynching of a young woman and her son in my grandpa's hometown, or my mother's secret life, or a mystical experience I had in India, or the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building by Timothy McVeigh, my concurrent tumultuous divorce, all of that happening at the same time, she said it was amazing how their interest would be piqued. People want a little bit of drama rather than a little bit of theology. Dramatic topics, she says, have, a gra- have the power to grab a hold of us, and we all know that. We want to know the the end of the story. We want to learn something we hadn't known or thought about before. So we all search for meaning and truth in our lives, which are often conflicted. Dr. Jones talks about the fact that all of those things that she mentioned in that list are things that have shaped her theology, and her view of the world. But she says, even in the most horrific of those stories, she says the most astonishing moments in her life and in those stories that have shaped her parents and grandparents, she says the most astonishing moments moments come when grace that imponderable gift of God breaks through the surface of life and shines its light on all that is. To Dr. Jones, there is no bigger or more dramatic story than the story of grace. When the inner workings of our lives are laid bare before us, and we see ourselves for who we really are. Just like whenever the prophet Isaiah came to the people of Judah and Jerusalem and said, God desired this for you, but this is what you have become. 
Something must be done. Even when we see our sins laid out before us, even in those moments, God can take all that is mysterious and troubling and in a flash we can have an amazing moment of recognition, an amazing moment whenever we see God's grace at work in a way we never imagined. We have an epiphany, a moment when we gain wisdom and understanding that ultimately transforms our lives. And this happens if we dare to look at our lives closely. If we stop and take a very true and honest and difficult look at our lives. Our lives that are filled with the horrible sins that maybe we have committed or that our family has hidden in its stories the shameful things that we have done or regretted, the incomprehensible tragedies that knock out our breath, the loves that have lasted and those that have failed. These are the stories of our life. And the event of daily human living is full of intrigue and drama, oddities, and all kinds of unpredictability. Just ask any of the teachers in the room. This is what life is like, as they have experienced it, probably especially this last week. That from the time we are small until the time we are gray and aged, life is full of drama and intrigue oddities, and all kinds of unpredictability. The challenge, according to Dr. Jones, is using our stories to explore where we see God in them. The challenge is using our stories to explore the questions, what do these stories tell me about myself and the purpose of my life, or our purpose and our lives? What do these stories say about my nature, or our nature, about the nature of God, about the future of our lives together? What does it say about suffering? What does it say about the sins we inherit and the glories we have yet to proclaim? What do, do those stories say about us and about God and the world in which we live. She says, if we ask these kinds of questions as we reflect on our life, then we will eventually find the God anchors in our lives. Those moments or those stories or those experiences that help to transform us, that help us to see God's God's face more clearly. Those stories that anchor our faith when everything else seems to be falling away. And as we do that, we grow in faith and moments of grace. That was a truth that the writer of Hebrews was trying to get across 2,000 years ago. The writer and Dr. Jones are trying to get us and the early church to understand the power of the story of God and humanity. In Hebrews, the writer is listing the great characters of faith. Some of them we may have heard when, about whenever, beginning whenever we were little and going to Sunday school or vacation Bible school. There are some of them are, are great heroes like David and, and Samuel and all of these great prophets. Some of them you might need to uh, brush up on some of those names that we don't quite talk about all of the time. But the people who were listening to, the, to the, this sermon from Hebrews would have known exactly who the writer was talking about, these great heroes of the story of faith. And as the writer lists them, 
he is reminding the people about how God was president, present in the lives of humanity in some very difficult times. The writer does this to remind those who are facing trying times, persecutorial times, times of trouble, tri times of trial, that they should remember that God is at work through history. That God throughout time has been with his people in the most dire circumstances. And so this great lift of, list of names, those who have gone before us, is this great cloud of witnesses, he calls them. These people of faith who could stand up and testify to the presence of God at work in the world, even in most difficult times. And all of that was leading to the moment whenever Christ came and the covenant made with Abraham and Sarah would be fulfilled. He says, don't lose faith because as much as they experienced of God's grace, as much of the, as they experienced of God's presence and guidance and leadership, you can experience even more because we have understood the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who has come to raise us all up. And so he says, remember, and we do. We tell and retell these stories of faith. We think about these ancient experiences and then we consider our own and we try to apply their wisdom to our own lives. We hang on to the stories and incorporate them into our stories of faith. When we emulate their courage or when we repeat their beautiful prayers or when they, we apply their experiences to our own lives today. So our theology our understanding of God comes from the story of our relationship with God and other people. Our faith grows as we stop to take stock of our lives and take an honest look at who we are. We can see where we've been. We can see where we have doubted God's presence, where we have found meaning and depth beyond ourselves, when we have been up to the challenge and when we haven't, where we have been following Jesus with great earnestness and enthusiasm in those times whenever we have doubted and turned our back on or struggled with God in our lives. All of this shapes us as a person in relationship to God and others. And this is our story. This is the story of us as individuals as well as us as the church. And so as we think about all of these different moments in our lives, as we reflect on who we are and what we are, we come to realize that theology is the birth of our story living in our lives. Dr. Jones tells a story in her own life about a, a story that she has heard that has been passed down from generation to generation. It's a story that she heard from the time she was so small. She says that it wasn't something I lived, but I have heard it so often that it has become integrated into my own life. She said it opened up an understanding of God for me from the time I was very little, and that understanding has not changed I go back to that story, she says, whenever everything else starts to crumble. It is a story that anchors me, much like those stories of faith anchored the people who were hearing from Hebrews. She shares this story that actually was a, her grandmother and great-grandmother's story. She writes that, her grandmother, Idabel, shared with her that on one hot summer day back in 1910, she was about five or six years old, and she was sitting under a wagon while her family 
was plowing the fields in Oklahoma. There is no hotter place on the planet than Oklahoma in the summertime. There is a wind that blows from in Oklahoma and down into Texas that comes from the gates of It is a hot wind. It doesn't cool you off. It's like a convection oven. It just cooks you faster and more evenly. It is a bitter heat. And I say this as having lived through two Julys here in Florida. There is no hotter place on the planet than Oklahoma in the summertime. And she says that her grandmother, who was a little girl at the time, was underneath the family wagon, watching her parents bust the sod on their farm. She said that she realized as she looked at the the mule that was there attached to to the wagon that life could be cruel because that poor mule couldn't get out and away from the beating down of the sun, but the little girl, Idabel, knew that she could be in the shade. She was so hot and miserable, all she could think about was how thirsty she was, and she just wanted to cry with the misery. But Dr. Jones says that her grandmother, Idabel, told this story with such consistency and precision so many times. She said she reached out and wrapped her hands around the metal water jug that was hanging from the underbelly of the wagon. Idabel said it felt so cool to her, so gorgeously refreshing, that she brought it closer to her and hugged the water jug with her whole body. Idabel said she forgot the impulse of thirst entirely and clung to the coolness of that metal jug. Dr. Jones says every time at the end of the story, Idabel would say that she felt like she was touching God, like she was hugging God and would never, ever again want to let go. Dr. Jones writes, her grandmother gave her that beautiful story and shared it so many times, as I said, that it became part of her. And her understanding of God is that God is like a cool water jug, that whenever you are desperate, whenever your thirst is overwhelming, whenever your discomfort and your pain is so great, that God is like that water jug that just brings relief to the very inner sanctum of our lives. She said she's realized over the years that this story is more important to her than any other stuffy European theologian that she has studied along the way. The story that's most important to her is that vision of grace of God the hug and the love and the being able to wrap oneself around this presence and never, ever, ever let go. The cooling love of God from that image, from that story from her grandmother has sustained her through multiple tragedies in her life, through difficult times, through learning experiences, through fear and pain, the image of the God who is present so completely with us that we can cling to it and find the rest and grace that we need. Today, I invite you to maybe take some time today or in the coming few days to ponder your own theology to ponder the stories of God in your own life or from the great cloud of witnesses that anchor your faith, that are at the core of your being and understanding of who and what God is. 
one of my anchor stories was the story I shared about my dad and I going fishing. My dad, being the Southern Baptist preacher that he was, took that moment later and said to me, you know, Llewellyn, what we did today whenever I said, I always saw you, even when you can't see me, I always see you, that's how it is with the Lord. There are times whenever you may think that you're alone and God isn't with you and nobody cares about you or nobody loves you, but you just need to remember that God is always there with you and God sees you and God is always going to be there to love you. That is a core story from when I was seven years old that has shaped and reshaped my life over the years. It is something that anchors me and that I cling to. That grace of God in the middle of being a frightened little child. When I feel like that frightened little child again, I cling to the understanding that God is there with me. Are you with me, Llewellyn? I'm with you, God. All right. That voice comes through. Take the time, take the time a few minutes each day to reflect on those stories. Take a moment to look at your life and see where the grace has popped up when you have least expected it. There are stories that anchor us when we are tossed about, and the importance of this is that it's not just our story. We are all part of the great witnesses of faith, this great cloud of witnesses. The story of God at work in the world is our story, and it is a beautiful story for us to share, to lift others up, and to say that God is with us in these moments, and we will call it grace whenever we can see the presence of God at work not only in our lives, but in the story of faith in the world. So let's add to that story. Not be afraid to look at our lives, to accept the grace that permeates it. For we are part of God's story. God's story in our own lives and in the whole family of God. And for that we say, thank you Jesus. And thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand with me this morning as we affirm our faith. It's our tradition that when we have heard the word read and proclaimed, we affirm our faith together. So I invite you to stand with me this morning. We're using a portion of the brief statement of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel. Alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let's remain standing and offer thanks and dedicate the gifts and the offerings that we have received today um, in our offering plate at the back. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we come dedicating all the good gifts that you have given to us. We ask that you take the gifts that we have, multiply them, and use them to add to the great cloud of witnesses as we share your grace in the world. In Christ we pray, amen. Please remain standing and we will sing our closing hymn, God Be With You, till we meet again.
just a reminder, we do have fellowship and Sunday, adult Sunday school immediately following the service. Uh, Sunday school is not going to be in the library today. It's going to be in the parlor. So just keep that in mind as you uh, prepare to go to Sunday school. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go from here, love, loving the Lord, filled with grace and peace, and serve the Lord. Amen.